Okay, so let's go ahead and get started here. Um, if you weren't in the last panel, my name is Michael O'Donnell. I work with Purdue Extension uh, in a statewide organic agriculture educator position. I was previously an uh, agriculture, a county agricultural educator in Delaware County, Indiana, and a couple of years ago our director of Extension asked me to take on this position, serve as more of a point person for um, questions coming into Extension in the College of Agriculture um, at Purdue uh, for the organic farming community in our state. So um, I'm going about trying to develop a more coordinated extension program and also some collaborative research efforts in our state um, so we can better support that community, the existing community, and bring more people along. And that's where a big focus of my work has been is, is helping to address questions and, and develop educational programs and networking opportunities for those who are transitioning ground into organic production in our state. And a lot of that is with grain production. It's a big, big focus of my efforts. So uh, just as a, a shameless plug, if you're not already signed up for enough winter meetings um, and you need another one and you're in the vicinity of, of Indiana, up here it'll come up on the scrolling image. But March 6th and 7th, we'll have a program in West Lafayette, Indiana at the Beck Ag Center. First day is more, fo there you go. First day is more focused for uh, new people, introductory information, what's National Organic Program about, thinking about transition, budgets, markets. Uh, we'll have a buyer panel and, and uh, farmer panels throughout the day. The second day we'll have a, a mix of more advanced topics and a small trade show. So if you're interested, there's the information. Uh, if that date doesn't work out for you, another one that uh, I've helped a little bit with, um, another organic grain focused conference. The Land Connection has one February 13th and 14th in Champaign, Illinois. So if those dates and location work better for you, um, check, or you want to do both, which I'll be doing, um, check that one out as well. All right, so our panel, uh, as you know, it's strategies for transitioning to organic grain crops. And I think the title's a little bit off because um, I don't think that there are any set recipes. And sometimes when I hear strategies, I think, I don't know, like somebody's trying to tell you how to do it. And I, I don't think that's the right approach. We, we learn, we can take in different farmers' experiences as they work through this process. We take the pieces that might fit in our, our unique context and try to work with them. Um, and I don't think that as an audience you should think that our panelists here are, are going to give you answers as experts necessarily, but simply sharing the experiences that they're having, okay, so that you can learn from those, their mistakes, their successes, and things that they're thinking about moving forward. Um, in my work, and I, I think I'm excited about this panel as well, you know, I like working with farmers who are, who are making the step, who are considering transition in that process because they're clearly taking themselves into, um, out of their comfort zone, right? Moving outside of kind of the status quo operation. And it's something that I, I relate to closely. Um, my background and my training and the early part of my uh, career life, I guess, was actually as an engineer uh, working with Cummins uh, working on diesel engine systems, and in my mid-20s had a complete shift getting into farming and working in agriculture and now working with Extension for almost seven years. Uh, so that's a pretty substantial transition in my life, and I, I feel like I relate to that as farmers are working through this, this transition to organic production because it, it's, a, it's moving outside of that comfort space. So with that, uh, what we're going to do is have each of our panelists give a brief overview about their situation, their farm, where they're at in the transition process, and then we'll, we'll sit them back down here. I might have a couple of questions that I throw at them to, to get us started, but then I mainly want the audience here to drive our questioning. Does that sound fair? All right. So we're going to go alphabetical on these guys just to keep it simple. So our first um, panelist, Dan Kaufman. He's from Minnesota, and I'm going to let him do the rest of the introduction. There we go. Here's the clicker. Take this one. Yep. The top one or the right one? Right. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Dan Kaufman from Nicollet, Minnesota. I'll be telling you a little bit about my farm. So first off, I guess who 
uh, be me, myself, um, and then a good friend of mine about my age and his dad. Together, uh, we're located about uh, 15, 20 miles northwest of Mankato in the Nicollet St. Peter area, Minnesota. Uh, together, we operate about 2,000 acres owned and rented land. Um, on our farm, we're really focused on soil health. Um, we've been going down that road or started that journey probably about uh, five, six years ago. Focusing on sustainability, and now we're learning that that's not good enough. We should be focused on regeneration. Um, some of the enterprises we have on our farm, uh, crops and livestock. So for the crop side, we have corn, soybeans, uh, corn silage, sweet corn, and cover crops. Uh, we also do some custom work, uh, custom strip tillage, side dressing nitrogen, and uh, custom cover crop seeding as well. I put the grass-fed beef on there. Um, as we learn more about soil health, we really uh, found out that we were missing that fifth link. Uh, the livestock, so we just uh, went ahead and bought some cows, so we're just in the beginning of that. Um, as far as our organic transition, we are just starting the journey, um, starting to climb up the mountain, so to speak. Um, been making preparations here for about a year, uh, talking to people in the industry and uh, visiting with friends and other members in the community that are organic. Um, so for 2019, we're going to have about 25 acres of CRP ground that will be certified organic. Um, year one transition, we'll have 40 acres of corn and 60 acres of soybeans. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. We're kind of taking baby steps at first, but we are really ready to go um, all in, our, in our organic just because it uh, fits in with the beliefs on our farm and we really like the system. Uh, as far as the crops on our farm, you can see in the pie chart there, um, our corn and soybeans are typically a 50-50 rotation, a um, little bit of corn silage and a little bit of sweet corn. For the cover crops, um, on the corn going to soybeans, uh, in the background picture, that's how we seed our cover crops in the corn, uh, old high clearance sprayer uh, with drop tubes to go between each row. Typically, we use uh, cereal rye, turnip radish, rapeseed um, for that. Uh, as we learn more about soil health and diversity, uh, we're looking at adding uh, some more species there towards the bottom of that chart and also looking to do some interseeding at V4, V6 corn just to get uh, more growth out of our cover crops in the corn. Uh, for the soybeans going to corn, um, typically been seeded with an airplane. Or we're also trying to build a uh, 80 or 120 foot machine to broadcast the cover crop over the soybean. Uh, winter wheat, cereal rye, oats, radish, winter canola, hairy vetch have been the primary ones. Also looking at adding some alfalfa or phacelia. Winter peas, sunflowers, again, just for diversity and maybe to try to get some legumes uh, to provide for the following corn crop. Um, as far as our crop rotation change, uh, as we transition to organic, um, in the non-organic fields, I feel like we're kind of stuck in the rut. You know, if you ask me what we're going to plant 10 years from now, I could tell you because it's, it's the same. It's kind of boring. You know, corn and soybeans, very little diversity besides cover crops. Um, as we move into the organic and transition there, I feel like the options are kind of endless and, you know, possibilities are endless. Uh, it's pretty exciting, you know. Our initial thoughts on a rotation might look something like a corn, soybean, small grain cover crop and then rotate back to corn. Uh, but really, uh, we could also think about alfalfa or edible beans, uh, pasture, hay ground, uh, sunflowers or just let cattle graze out there for a whole year you know like I said the options are endless and we're really excited about that and the main thing is the high diversity of uh, plant species and also integrating livestock into that as well some of the challenges uh, we face so far uh, the organic certification process that's uh, that's probably the biggest one so far I don't feel like we're confused about it you know we have so many questions or we don't know all the answers or it's brand new to us, so we really have no idea. You know, working with a certifier and contacting them on every little thing that we're doing or we want to do and making sure that gets approved and all the paperwork that goes along with it, that's uh, I don't know, probably one of the biggest challenges so far. Uh, next thing is weed control, I would say. Um, on our conventional ground, we're, uh, you know, like I said, no-till and no-till beans and strip-till corn. We really don't want to stay with that system because we like how that fits into our operation. So we really want to try to stay that course going into organic and I know uh, it's been mentioned here before that you know tillage is not all bad and we would agree with that but we would really like to stay you know 
no-till and strip-till if we can. Um, last challenge there I would say is kind of a mindset change. You know, uh, Jeff had mentioned it a little bit too. It's you got to do something a little different or think outside the box, so to speak. Um, so we really got to put on our thinking cap and think differently and try to see how it fits into our our plan and our rotation uh, to try to make some of these things work that we want to do on our farm. And also, there's really no easy button to push. I feel like uh, in the conventional world, you know, we can go fishing for the weekend, call a co-op and say, yeah, I'll go spray that field for me or take care of this. Well, on organic, you can't really do that. Um, so that'll just be a little more challenging. There's, you know, there's options, but uh, none are going to be super easy. So I guess that's a little background of my farm. Uh, any questions? How are you going to get the weeds out of the strip-tailed uh, row? Uh, we're looking at doing some uh, flame weeding, maybe. Just right over the... Yeah. That's our initial thought. Would, would you have a tying weeder that just goes over the row, too? Does that work? No, typically what we want to do is we want to strip-till in the fall prior to the corn crop and then plant into that stale seed bed without any tillage in the spring. So we've had good luck with that in our conventional acres. And then flame it a couple times. Possibly, yes. We're open to other options too, but we're, we're learning. How do you plan on selling your transitional bean and corn? Do you have a buyer for transitional or are you just going to sell it any conventional? Most likely it'll just be conventional. We have some ethanol plants pretty close to us, so the market there is pretty good for the corn. Uh, on the bean side, not quite sure yet. We're looking into maybe some uh, non-GMO beans. Uh, there's a buyer fairly close to us in St. Peter um, in contact with them regarding some of that. So that's kind of what we're thinking for now, but uh, like I said, we're always open to other options or to see what comes up for, for that. Well, let's, let's hold our questions. Maybe jot them down as we're going through these introductory presentations because we're going to have most of this session for Q&A. So. Thank you. Up, up next we have uh, John Jovog, uh, and he's going to talk about their family farm and give us the same kind of introduction. Sounds good. Uh, hi, uh, yeah, my name is John Jovog, and I farm uh, near Austin, Minnesota with my father and my wife, who's sitting up here. And um, I guess uh, kind of a little snapshot of our operation. Do I just hit down here? There you go. We kind of have... Um, uh, we kind of, uh, you know, grow corn, soybeans, uh, some hay, oats, some small grains, and then we also have um, uh, some uh, pigs, mostly pigs and sheep. That's most of our livestock that we have uh, integrated into our system. And so just um, uh, that we, we raise, they're kind of a niche market uh, for both of those, but that are, um, uh, you know, indoor-outdoor pigs, it's for Nyman Ranch, so it kind of works, works good in our, in our system and, and produces the, uh, some fertilizer that we do need. So just a quick snapshot of our, our transition to organic. I came back to the family farm in 2011, uh, and in 2014 was the first year uh, that we actually had some certified organic ground. Before that, we were just basically corn-soybean rotation with just a little bit of hay mixed in there. Um, my wife was the one who really got the idea started <laughs> in terms of transitioning to organic. And um, so we, we kind of started small. I just transitioned to a 12 acre hay field that I plowed under and put it in corn just to see how it would work. And uh, that went fairly well that first year. Uh, it takes a little time to build up equipment and figure out what you're doing. So we kind of stuck our toe in the water to start with. Then, uh, but as of now in 2018, uh, we have 100, or as of last year I should say, we had 130 acres that are certified as organic. We have another 50 acres that are in year two transition, 100 acres that are in the first year, and then 140 that are still conventional, but we're in the process of, of kicking those into uh, transition here uh, later this year. So by 2022 is when we're hoping to have the whole farm transitioned over to uh, uh, to or, uh, organic. So we farm, you know, as you can tell, we're just, just over 400 tillable acres. We've got about 500 acres total, but some is in the woods. And uh, so the rotations that we have, they're always with these rotations, we're always kind of uh, open to new ideas in terms of how we're going to rotate. We have, I've got a couple of different rotations depending on how our farm is set up. We have a main county road that splits our farm up, so it's easy to rotational graze part of it, and the other part is more of a challenge. So 
The one rotation, uh, rotation A, that's uh, oats interseeded with a hay pasture mix. And then we come back and, uh, and do have it as hay or pasture that we rotational graze with the sheep or the cattle uh, for a couple of years and then we roll it back into corn. That rotation has worked very well for us. The corn, you know, has produced really well. We've had real good luck with that and uh, very low weed pressure. And then rotation B, we, we have oats uh, or I'm looking at trying to get in with a canning company that does some organic uh, uh, canning crops. And then we'll follow that with an early rye and doing some roller crimping um, with the rye for the next year of soybeans that we roller crimp down. And, and that we have just did last year for the first year and, and looking to do a lot more this year because we planted some, uh, some rye early. That way we can get that rye planted early enough if we follow a small grain. And then, uh, then follow that with a uh, cover crop in the soybeans and then into corn, um, which we intercede. We've, we've gone in with a gandy, or not a gandy, but with a, a high boy and, they, and seed down some cover crops here into the standing corn. And so that rotation has worked fairly well. If we run into some weed problems, that's rotation C because weeds is definitely a challenge. And that's where we do the oats with the cover crop and then one year of alfalfa. So with the oats, you cut the oats early the weeds don't have a chance necessarily to head out or to get viable seed. Then you follow it up and, and you're doing uh, uh, alfalfa or um, that following year. So you cut that so those weeds do not have a chance to germinate for a couple of years and then follow back in with corn. So that's kind of our three, three different options. But of course, like I said, we're always trying to, uh, always learning. So like I said, the challenges, and you can tell by the back picture here, that is uh, a soybean field that uh, had some weeds that got a little ahead of us there. Uh, that was not in the roller crimping. That was a couple of years ago. But uh, weeds are definitely a challenge that we, you know, you're always kind of struggling with and trying to figure out ways to uh, uh, deal with. And unfortunately, we don't have the uh, band-aid of just calling the local elevator and having come out and take care of it. Um, then, you know, finding, acquiring the right equipment because from going from conventional to organic, there's a whole new uh, set of challenges in terms of how you're going to do certain tasks and, and, uh, and jobs to try to manage the weeds, get the crops in right, and, and uh, do what you need to do. And that goes along with the timing of everything, um, you know, cultivating, rotary hoeing, when to roll or crimp, all of those things have been... It's, they've been challenges, but it's actually a lot of fun because with the conventional side, it's pretty straightforward and, and not a lot of, uh, not as much thought needs to go into that as with the organic side. You don't have some of those uh, band-aids that you can with conventional, so then you can kind of, uh, it takes a lot more thought. So, and then while we're in the transition stage, cleaning all the equipment, keeping the bins, you know, cleaning bins, making sure that your conventional is, is separated from your organic and, and uh, shuffling, shuffling everything around so that you can time everything right for when you're using your corn dryer to, to when you're, uh, so that you don't have to re-clean things too many times. And so that takes a lot of uh, maneuvering. So it's gonna be, a, uh, it'll be a lot uh, easier and smoother when we can get everything 100% certified. Uh, record keeping, uh, luckily my wife helps a great deal with that and keeps, uh, keeps us on track with that. And, um, and then the cash flow during transition, that's kind of uh, why we started small and we're kind of going through it over, over a number of years here is because we wanted to iron out some of our learning curve, I guess, uh, on a smaller scale for that worked better for our situation. And then some overspray, we've had a couple things go on there when you have some conventional and some, uh, some organic, we actually called the co-op to spray one field and they came in and went through our organic stuff. And, and it was, of course, not GMO beans and it didn't take long to realize what happened. So that, uh, you, we, we had a little trouble with that, but those are things that you just kind of have to work through. So, uh, and then some observations about the transition. Uh, I think one, you know, like, some other people have said the number of records that you've got to keep, the number of, you know, everything you kind of have to keep track of. We've got a big three inch binder that we put everything in and, and keep everything organized the best we can. Uh, always, you know, there's some concern over GMO contamination with neighbors and, and uh, things along those lines. And all of our other corn, as soon as we decided to do some uh, uh, organic, 
Then we went all non-GMO with uh, with our other crops. So then that's even with our soybeans this year, we're going to be all non-GMO, uh, even on the conventional ground that we're going to start transitioning. And so that that um, is to try to keep everything as smooth as we can. And uh, and like I have typed there, the more I learn, the more I realize how little I know. That is. Uh, the more and more things go on, the more that seems to be true. And so, um, and the other thing is, is a lot of people look at organic for the potential income, but you definitely have to be kind of all in with, uh, with it because there's challenges, more risks, there's more, um, a, a lot more thought that goes into everything and every decision that you make. So there's definitely more risk, but hopefully more, uh, pay out also and to try to keep we're, we're not a large farm we're a small family farm and and so uh, you know we did have to step back and say well what are we going to do if we want to keep farming so between the livestock and and uh, and transitioning to organic I think it's working out fairly well so just a quick picture of my family and thank you very much <clears throat> any, any quick clarifying questions for John, I wondered. Uh, so the the animals, any mm -hmm. of them certified? No, the the livestock is not certified organic as of now. Uh, we're it's niche markets um, for it, but they are not certified as of now. That is something we're looking at to in the future once we get everything transitioned, because then we'll be growing enough corn and things like that to feed through for the pigs. But uh, but that's that's a little later, a couple years down the road yet. Well, thank you. I guess that's how I'll start. I'll say thank you uh, to Dan and John and all of you guys for being here to maybe join us on this endeavor. It might be a little scary, but uh, it's very rewarding. And I think uh, if we're not, we find ourselves not correct, we'll all be wrong together. So there's strength in numbers, so we can take some <laughs> solace in that. So. Here we go, organic farming. Uh, my name is Joel Lehman, and I am from southwestern Michigan. I apologize, I forgot to add my slide where my geography is, but if no one else is from Michigan, you guys can't do this. I'm from here. So <laughs> I'm off of Lake Michigan and just north of the Indiana line. Um, and, and I've got this slide titled, Bloodied, Battered, and Still Smiling. And that's how I feel a lot of days. Um, it is a battle, and it's not always fun. But it's not going to be fun it's going to be worth it that's what i tell everybody that asks me um, and at the end of the day i am still smiling uh, i probably am the most positive person in my peer group uh, in agriculture and the reason is is that i embarked on this organic transition and path and all you have to do is walk outside these doors or walk downstairs and see all these young people at uw sitting here eating lunch and those are the people that we're feeding. Those are the people that are making decisions that are, we are going to feed in the future. So I, uh, I applaud all of you for being here. Um, so what, what we've got, I'm 42 years old. I'm a third generation farmer uh, with a fruit and vegetable background primarily. Row crop also. Uh, the part of Michigan that I live in, we're a highly diverse area. Uh, vegetables and fruit, we get a climate moderating effect from Lake Michigan. Uh, so when I grew up, we did a lot of direct marketing and commercial production. So what I mean by that is we not only raised tomatoes and apples and uh, cucumbers for grocery chain type of business. We had packing shed where we pack semi-load after semi-load of produce, but we also would sit on the tailgate at an intersection selling peaches or strawberries or whatever we had had picked that morning. So. For me, growing up, I learned who my customer was and what they wanted because I had a lot of direct contact and I hated it. Every day of it, I hated it. But it was very valuable to me to learn who the customer is and what they want. And ultimately, I think that's what pushed me to organic today. So I say I'm a third generation farmer and that's true, 
but the family farm that I grew up on is no longer in business. There was nothing for me on the family farm. It was declining. Um, so it was made very clear to me that I needed to go get an education. So I went to Michigan State and I got an agri-science degree and I figured that I was relegated to going to get a job and I loved agriculture and I wanted to be an ag, uh, but it was always preached to me that you can't make it farming. You can't make it, you can't make it. And I believed that for a while. Uh, so I left school and I worked on a couple farms. Uh, I worked on a dairy. I got some experience there, a large row crop and dairy. I worked in partnership with a, a father-son team. We set up a satellite potato growing operation in my area. So I ran a potato farm for four years. And then I went and worked ag retail for seven years. So I sold chemistry and fertilizer and CCA agronomist and GMOs and, you know, down the Kool-Aid train I went and I was that guy and here I am today talking about organic and I'm happy and smiling about it. Um, so I started my own farm in 2007. I was fortunate that I had a job and I didn't have any children at that time. I was not married. I guess I was married at that point, but um, I decided that that's what I wanted to do and I worked a full-time job for seven years, I was able to come back to the farm full time in 2012. And that's where we're at today. So 2018, and you see here, I got a picture of grapes. We also have some grapes on our farm. Uh, we were Welch growers for Welch's grape juice. And we actually took a contract buyout last winter uh, from Welch's. So the grapes may get cleared. I'm still trying to find a buyer because I already have them through year one of transition to organic. So I would like to be able to raise grapes organically for juice, but I'm really struggling to find a buyer, somebody to bottle it. So if anybody out here has any interest, let me know. Um, so in 2018, my crop mix was, we raised some peas and some green beans. Uh, those are snow peas uh, and green beans. They're contracted vegetable production for canners and, and frozen also. Uh, I raised some edible beans, some blacks and pinnels. Corn and, excuse me, corn and soybeans, of course. Uh, soybeans are not my favorite. I try to eliminate those whenever I can, just at my place. And a little small grain. We, my area of the world, we have virtually no dairy. And we, our wheat yields are terrible. Uh, conventional farmers in my area, I think county average is 60 bushel wheat. And we just can't raise good small grains. We're on very well-drained soils. Um, I'm about 80% irrigated. And, you know, we play around with some other vegetable crops. We raise some butternut squash. Um, so in 2018, my mix uh, was just a pinch over 1,200 acres certified, uh, 400 in transition, and I've still got 400 acres rented out. Uh, as I, when I decided to make the big jump to organic, I knew that I couldn't, I didn't want to try to farm both ways. You can't ride two horses with one ass. So decided we were gonna focus on organic. I took some uh, conventional ground and rented it to a neighbor and that's where it's at today. And as I can financially take it back, that's what we're going to do and get it into transition. So I've been pulling some ground into transition every year, you know, as, as I can sustain the financial sucking sound. So total acres, 2,000, roughly. Um, I put this in there because this is a picture that's pretty telling to me, okay? So when I walk in the field and I try to be in every field every other day, so I actually spend a lot of time in my pickup now walking and walking and walking, drive to fields and walk. And Obviously, I thought this was noteworthy enough to take a picture of it because as far as I'm concerned, we've already failed at this stage. Now, it might not look like it, and we came and cleaned this up and the field was clean. But as far as I'm concerned, this is cause for stomach acid. When you have green weeds already, when you have a crop that's that short. 
yeah, there's rooting separation and we can go pluck those out with the tine weeder and we can cover them up with a cultivator, but we really had created a problem for ourselves because we weren't on, on our game. Uh, what does it look like when you do it right? Everybody likes to show those pictures. I didn't show any failure pictures in here, I don't think. Um, but this is a pinot bean field and I think that's what they're supposed to look like, right? That field's uncultivated. We never cultivated it. And I think these are the things that I'm learning as I go through my organic transition and I've been certified here for a few years on some ground is that once you get it right, it's right. And we spend so much of our time working on the ground that's bad. It's like the problem child in the classroom. The smart kids, the teachers never talk to. It's that one or two problem children that spend all, the teacher spends all of their time. And that's how I find on my farm too. Um, this is that same field about 30, 40 days later. And I mean, you can see there's a few weed escapes up there to the left, but I say escapes, we never cultivated it. I think that's a pinot field. I think it went like 28 bags. So when it's right, it's right. Uh, cover crops, you know, multi-species mixes, that I, I really give a lot of credit. And I'm not using small grain, but I'm able to use my pea crop, my green bean fields, because those are 60 day crops. So I can come in behind a green bean crop and I can make a cover crop look like this in late September. And this really sets me up well to change up the pest cycle, the disease cycle, the weed cycle, and it sets me up for a good corn crop the following year. So successes, you know, field crop of corn, I think we, I feel like we've got it pretty well figured out. I think we're fi finding that we have some pretty good success in that. Low growing crops, soybeans, green beans, etc. cetera. Uh, Broadleaf weed escapes, we bought a weed zapper. Uh, it just works. Uh, it's an escape problem, right? And, and you already had to have damage, but you can go clean up a mistake for broadleaf weeds. Uh, cover crop benefits following short season crops, I just touched on that. And later planted crops. Those pinno beans were planted July 7th. Uh, and, and I don't know, I can't even tell you how many degree days I typically get, but I can tell you this, that there's something going on, I'm not a scientist, but there's something going on, it's either hours of night that the weeds are picking up and when we get so far the weeds are saying it's not time to go anymore i missed my opportunity to germinate i'll just wait some people think they need to go and field cultivate a field every time it gets a tinge of green and they're going to eliminate the weed seed bank and i'll talk long and fast about my opinions about that uh, I, we let it go we hit it once it's clean because I think it has to do with the day length, but maybe I'm crazy. So here we go, our challenges, right? This is a major challenge for me. Cover crop termination, it'll eat your lunch if you let it get away from you. You let your cereal rye go 10 days too long, she starts putting on some carbon, and now it, you are gonna fight that problem when you go to tine weed, when you go to do everything. It's gonna tie up mineralizing nitrogen, this is something that you cannot drop the ball on. A cover crop does you the most good when it's growing. So it's like this quandary that I find myself in. You know, I wanna let it grow as every day I can, every hour. But then I have to remember, you gotta go kill it so you can get your crop in. Everybody else has said it and I will, you know, resonate the same message. It's timing, it's timing. You're not gonna be on the golf league. You're not gonna be on, on time to the birthday party always. Uh, because when it's time to be in the field, you have to be in the field. Or your lack of management will become readily apparent to you if you're not. Uh, the pest cycling thing I talked about. Crop rotations, new to all these things, right? These are the pieces of the puzzle that are different for everyone's operation that's here. And, it's, and at my place, I like to spread maybe those pinot beans because Maybe my weed control is easier, but now I don't have to try to cultivate those pinot beans when I'm cultivating corn. 
so I can spread my workload of my planter, of my cultivators, my tine weeders, and it just helps me spread everything out. Cover crop establishment. We're in Wisconsin. They talk about how challenging it can be. It's really difficult to get a cover crop established behind an edible bean crop uh, into a corn crop. So the greatest one, I would say my greatest challenge when I started this organic thing, I had a full head of hair. <laughs> Obviously, that is one of my greatest challenges today is that it has cost me a little vanity, but somehow I'll get by. So that is all I have. What's in my multi-species mix? Um, I can't tell you them all. I'm sure I can't remember them all. But, uh, we've planted three or four different ones, and I can get it to you if you'd like. Uh, typically, we're like nine species or up to 14, and you try to spread them out. It starts with buckwheat, and then you get, you know, you time your flowering, so that flowers, and then it goes away. And then you got some millet, and you got some all you know four or five grasses warm and cool and then you got three or four broad leaves and I have found that I can try to keep some costs down I don't see a lot of benefit in using massive amounts of pea or radishes or turnips or two three pounds sometimes is all you need a pound two pounds give it a little diversity I don't think we need 15 pounds of each species uh, it really gets cost prohibitive is what I found I think you just need to give it a little bit and then let mother nature do her work so I'll sit here with these gents so let's, let's kind of move to a little more group Q&A here um, so I just have have one question I'd like to start off with and I heard it just a little bit from a couple of you but noticeably I didn't hear any comment on it from from Joel um, and Dan, I don't, I don't know that you'll be able to say too much. You said it's, it's, it's a question mark and something that's looming in the future as you start transitioning. But uh, more for John and Joel, how has the certification process been for you? Um, you know, in, just in terms of your initial experience with it and setting up record keeping, your initial OSP application, the inspection process, you know, were there things that surprised you for better or worse? Uh, and, and things that you would recommend for people just looking forward to that? Well, uh, yeah, for, for our first year that we certified, um, oh, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for our first year that, was, that, that we certified, um, that was in, in 2014. I know my wife spent a lot of time because we farmed together and uh, you know, researching, making sure she, we kind of understood things. And we, I remember when that inspector came that first time, uh, they were there a while because we had questions and went through, I mean, I think they were there, I don't remember how long, probably twice as long as the rest of the years. But yeah, it just took a lot of time to kind of work through. We were calling the, the certifier uh, many times to try to say, hey, you know, I want to make sure we can do this and how about that, you know. So asking the certifier often before you do something, especially the first few years, is, is a key part to it to make sure that you don't put something out there, do something that can, you know, that you don't think about necessarily, but can cause you problems. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I would, for myself, I think I had to be diligent about record keeping. And I knew from day one that it was going to be something that took effort every day and the amount of acres that we transitioned and in farming I'm not doing all of the work obviously I have a couple of full-time guys and I have a binder that rides with me in my truck and I'm in it every day and I record who's doing what where every day I have cleaning records in there we have uh, operational sheets for every field and I am happy, I am happy to do the paperwork, no matter how long it takes me, because that is the difference in the office between 350 corn and 950 corn. So I am well compensated for doing that paperwork. What we're doing in the field, I would almost make the case is just about the same amount of work. 
It just looks different, okay? Uh, where we really are compensated uh, is where we, it's in the process, the certification process. I have been very happy with my certifier. I've had a seamless experience. We take care of our paperwork, we ask questions, we get ahead of things. I would not recommend getting behind on anything because you will really be hating life. Just gotta try to stay ahead of it. That's what I think. Okay. Sure, yeah, question. Uh, I was wondering, uh, each of you gentlemen could indicate, what was the initial thing that pushed you toward or you stro strongly considered organic farming. Well, that's, and, that's, that's and perfect. And to sustain it. I mean, uh. okay. That was another question I had on my list, so thank you. Okay, so my, my story has been uh, I went to the Fort Wayne Farm Show in, I think it was in 2014, the winter of 15, February, I think it was. And I walked through there and I left. And when I left there, Outside the Fort Wayne Coliseum, there's a Chipotle Mexican Grill. And you know, you see all these things on social media and the farm community really doesn't care for Chipotle Mexican Grill or at that time, really didn't. They were pretty vocal about it. So I went in, because I'd never been to one. And I wanted to see what the, all the fuss was about. And I wasn't impressed. It was just a Mexican restaurant, right? Fast food, I got a burrito and I left. And I went down the road a half a mile and I pulled into the McDonald's to get a Coke, because I like Coke from McDonald's. And the driveway, the, the line was too long in the drive-thru. So I pulled into a spot and I walked in. And I made it a three or four steps into the restaurant and I stopped. And it hit me like somebody hit me in the face. 37, 38 years old I was at the time. I was the oldest person down there at Chipotle. And I was the youngest person at McDonald's. And I thought to myself, that's what the future is. That's what people want. These, the future buyers of food just showed me where they're going to spend their money, where they see value. So that was my, what hit me in the face. And I think I came home that day and I told the guys in the shop, I said, we're going all in. That's what we're gonna do. I guess for me, the, uh, the epiphany probably was, uh, we used to help our neighbors as kids and they were organic so that was always kind of in the back of my mind ever since I had grown up and then uh, last summer we had a meeting with Anders Gerda from Pipeline Foods. He came down to our farm and we were just more so curious at the time but uh, he had one heck of a presentation so to speak and I mean he, a lot of knowledge and a lot of insight there and that was, that really got our gears turning and then uh, in Austin, Minnesota uh, Tom Cotter, he had a field day that was talked a little bit more about organic and transitioning and that that was probably the turning point for us on the way home from that meeting you could just tell we were we knew this was the direction we wanted to go and that we needed to go on our farm so that yeah the Anders Gerda thing and the Tom Cotter field day that was that was it. For, for, uh, for us I think it was in Oh, 20, 2011 to 2012, I, I just had come back to the family farm. My dad's always been more uh, conservation-minded. He's tried to do a lot of things over the years, but uh, I, my wife actually took me to, a, uh, to the organic. She signed up and took us to the organic conference in, in La Crosse, and we went to that and, and went to a lot of meetings, and, and um, that kind of, my wife was the one who kind of, started talking to me about it. At first I was probably a little more hesitant. I mean, we were doing a lot of things to, uh, uh, you know, try to do, you know, looking at a lot of different options there. But, but uh, thanks to her, we, she really was the one who kind of got it, the, the, the seed uh, <laughs> stuck in my head, I guess. And uh, the more we talked about it, the more we, we thought about it. And it was really something that we just kind of decided we wanted to do. So I would say that was the, uh, me. So uh, I guess a follow up on that, what have been some of the key then resources, people, uh, online resources, events like this that, that have helped you get the information that you need to be successful and continue down this path? Uh, being here, 
meetings, I mean, you can gain an invaluable amount of information networking with folks who have, I mean, how do they say it? You know, you want to pay attention to the shop teacher who's missing fingers when he talks about using the safety on the saw. So those are the people that you want to talk to. And, you know, there's so many podcasts. There's so many, so much information that you can get a hold of from the warmth of your office. And I think there's nothing that can ever compare to boots on the ground, walking and actually doing it yourself, but you can set yourself up for success, certainly by uh, networking and coming to meetings like this and Moses Conference. Um, I think you just have to go and listen and listen and listen. Yeah, I, w I, would, uh, I would agree. I, I, I would think for myself, my dad, uh, you know, I kind of came back and, and working in the farm uh, as my dad's kind of uh, not necessarily retiring, but he said he wants to take longer vacations. So he um, he's helped me a lot through a lot of this stuff. I mean, he's got a, a wealth of knowledge from many, many years of uh, of farming and uh, and then conferences and, and meeting people and some, a couple of neighbors now are starting to do some organic around us and, and uh, yeah, just just a lot of there's a lot of options to, to look at things. So. I would basically say the same thing. The meetings that you can attend related to organic or uh, anything on the internet, you know, YouTube, podcasts, uh, books, uh, it's all pretty valuable information. And then I've even had a lot of conversations with uh, different certifiers, you know, bouncing ideas or questions off them. And, you know, so there's a wealth of information out there that you can use too. Okay, sure, here. So in your transition acres or, or what you're transitioning, um, like, so I, I'm just starting the transition process and starting, like, anyway. So what are your additional expenses inside the transition process? Because like everybody keeps talking about how can you afford to do it, you know, if you're not gonna. To me, my cash flow is actually pretty close to my no-till cover ground. So I don't understand why there's, why people keep talking about how much more it's gonna cost them to transition. So I guess your experience is with managing finance, cash flow finances in transition, right? That's essentially yeah. what you're getting I mean, at? Yeah. I guess I don't, uh, in our projections, you know, this will be our first year transitioning and we're not really projecting any, any financial difference. Um, granted, we hope that the yield should be similar, you know, using a non-GMO corn or soybean. We don't foresee really any difference there. Um, you know, all of our field operations are essentially the same. We're saving money on, you know, herbicide and some fertilizer costs. So actually I think we might even be a touch better, but again, that'll depend on kind of how the crop yields. It just, in my experience, like I, I, plan, I even plan in like rather than having my, uh, you know, uh, crop, but I actually plan in like possibly walking beans or something like yeah. that. I mean, as a rescue kind of right. thing, like I did. Yeah. I put that in my budget, but that pretty much puts it to where it was last year. Mm -hmm. Previous years. Yeah, the, the costs um, aren't much different, you know, in terms of what you're, because you end up, uh, you know, versus GMO seed versus conventional, uh, you know, non GMO seed, you, you're actually less cost for, for some of the seed costs, then, um, um, you know, you're not spraying or, or, or doing some of that, but you are spending more time out cultivating and, and you know, you're running across the field a few more times if you're doing, doing the, uh, the standard time meeting or where we're going or, or uh, cultivating. But um, I think, you, you know, when you get into, for me, the one year is when I have that small grain crop that's still conventional. Uh, or still transitional. That's the those yields. You know, you don't have that organic price. So, so when you get a multiple rotation, you, you know, for me versus just the corn and soybeans, you know, that that oats or small grain crop that we grow that that first year of uh, or as we transition, that's the one that that's probably a little tougher. But we're not doing every acre at the same time, so it's uh, it's it's not not a huge difference, but uh, but that's the one that. Yeah, and I, and I agree. I would say cost-wise, acre for acre, there's not a huge difference. I think there's a lot of hate in the ag community about organic, and I think there's a lot of uh, 
myths that people like to perpetuate and you're going to harvest a half a crop or a quarter of a crop or you might as well just sell a couple of your trucks or your wagons or because uh, that you're not going to need them anymore well let them say what they want to say i think there's a lot of that so don't be afraid if somebody is you think there's well what am i missing what am i missing if that's what you're sitting there thinking exactly right. i don't think you should be nervous um i think it's reasonable to expect some yield hits along the way because tuition is expensive and you're learning and we pay to learn typically so i think that's not unreasonable but some of that can be mitigated by uh, likely there's a non-gmo soybean premium that you can pick up so you're going to offset a little bit of that maybe in the cornfield there's a little bit you can pick up depending where you're uh, situated it's pretty paltry it seems to me but um, that third year is the problem or you know depending how you're set up in your cycle uh, I made the comment that I'm pulling ground in as I can afford to do it and I took a little different approach in how I brought all my stuff in and I went and found a bunch of little fields I could certify right away so I had increased cash flow and then I could pull larger chunks of land in and I actually have let some farms sit fallow that needed it so there is a hit there um, I didn't come from a multi-generational farm fa a family where there was a bunch of stuff paid for. I had nothing. I started with a toolbox that I bought at Sears. I mean, it started from zero. So that has been really challenging and that's where I say, okay, man, I really feel like I'm hitting a home run if I can let a field lay fallow and not have any income off of it because something else has to feed the land payment or the rent or whatever. But all in, I would say don't don't sit there thinking I'm waiting for you know the, the clouds to open up on me because I, I don't think it's there. I think you're on the right track. It, when you say fallow, you mean a cover crop fallow? Correct, yeah. correct. A fallow year, uh, uh, yes, yes. I actually had a piece that I laid fallow and we field cultivated it all summer because it had Johnson grass in it. And I, it was T2 and I figured I would rather let a T2 field sit, a field sit instead of have a Johnson grass problem in $9 corn that I had to fight forever. So in that instance, I said, well, what's gonna make me the least amount of sad? I guess I'll forego a crop when it's T2 and, and let her lay and we'll just get the Johnson grass problem taken care of. you know just just learning that timing issue and mother nature doesn't always cooperate with your timing but um, just you have to be ready to go right now I mean if it's if it's um, the first year that I had uh, some uh, organic corn was certified organic corn it was a hay field that I plowed down just a little 12 acre field but I bought went out and found a, a cheap cultivator somewhere and you know I mean I was uh, <laughs> it was a very cheap cultivator and um, uh, learned uh, very quickly in terms of you know trying to get it adjusted and set and then it rained and things like that I didn't get through it like I should have the first year I still had okay yields but I would say just just knowing that timing and getting that stuff set and adjusted right taking the time to do that and um, I don't know just uh, I think you said it where you're, you're, you might not go golfing that day <laughs> yeah. if, even if you had it planned. <laughs> yeah. And, and my, my only comment about weed control is if you're controlling weeds that are green, you already messed up. You need to control weeds that are white. That really needs to be the goal. In the white thread stage, that's when we need to try to control our weeds that are out there. If they're little green ones, what's the problem? Uh, it's much harder to, to control a green you weed. You yeah, you have to do it. You have to have a lot more soil disturbance. You have to throw dirt on them. You have to, uh, any idiot can control weeds in between the rows, right? It's in the row that's the problem. And if I have a, a white thread weed that I can just, my time meter can run across it, flick it, stir the soil surface, and everything dries out. Dry it out. Yeah, then I'm a hero. 
But if I let things get a little bit, you know, a half inch tall, an inch tall, and they're green, now that plant is photosynthesizing, it's making sugar, it's making energy, and it's trying to live. Whereas that white thread is just living off the energy in that seed. It, it doesn't have very much fight in it. So if it keeps raining for five days in a row, it's kind of tough because you can't dry out that top inch. Welcome to organic. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I'm, that's, 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 well, that's a challenge. That's when you have to come back with. I talked to the farmer last this summer. He said, the two fields, one was beautiful, no weeds. He goes, well, this one, we had the time where we planted it, it didn't rain for five days. And the other one, they planted it, and it rained a couple days later. Huge difference in weed pressure. Do you find that too? Where you, can you time it that way, or do you try to? You can't control, I mean, it's, if it's, you know, sometimes you do, yeah, I mean, then, then you just have to come in there with, with what you can, cultivators or, or uh, other things to try but to, I mean, try to get that out later. Say, well, I'm going to take these three weeks, I'm going to plant between these three weeks, you know, let's say the second week of May to the first week of June, and I'm going to find five days where it's not going to rain. Mm -hmm. You try to turn the window where it's not going to rain five days after you plant, or is that not necessarily? <laughs> We've not been able to. I, yeah, the yeah, last few no. springs, uh, we have typically two days, right? You have the day that it quit raining and the day before it starts raining again. And it might be the same day. So we, yeah, we just have to go when we can go. And it's not always perfect. And uh, time weeding and cultivating, I say, is like voting in Chicago. Early and often. Mm -hmm. Just go. If you have nothing, if you go out there and go, well, I think I don't need to go again. You, that means no. you need to go again. Yeah. Any experience with with broadcast flaming in wet conditions? I, I do not have a flamer. or Haven't used one. So. I don't have a flamer either. Okay. Have you researched it? The flamers? I think I would like to try to buy one this winter. Actually, yeah. yeah these guys that I've talked about flamers, when they can't time me to pick flamer. You have a comment there. I'm a, uh, an inspector, and so I've got a few comments. I really enjoyed this presentation. I've got a few comments as reminders from an inspector's perspective in the certification process, if, if I may. There's a couple of comments. One is it's 36 months, not three seasons. So be very careful to note the date of the last prohibited substance. As an inspector, on transitional land, coming into our area, you've got to see that. And not just out of your memory, I think it was in June. Some verifiable documentation, like your receipt from the co op or whatever, that shows the date of that last transit substance. The other thing is, we look for seat records for 36 months. And often, guys, well, here in Wisconsin, we have a lot of guys coming out of Alfalfa that was planted four years ago. So it's not a real big deal for them. But that last 36 months of seeds in the tags. We want to see that those seeds were untreated. Okay, so I'm just saying, well, we put a sorghum sedan. No, show me the sorghum sedan seeds that you used uh, during that transition. Those are really important. Uh, uh, and then any other materials that have been in the soil, call your certifier, even if you're not in the full certification process yet, and make sure that the substance you're going to apply is allowed. Because uh, I go to farms that are and it's like, oh, wait a minute, you put in a treated seed, you know, last year, I'm sorry, but this land is not moving forward. It may seem like a simple little thing, but it wasn't, a, wasn't an allowed substance, so they've gone back to their start date of 36 months. Yeah, pelletized gypsum is a good one. I, I think a number of these things are going to be covered in the next session they by are. Harriet, right? They are. Yeah. But just, just a solid point for you. Great. And, and, and call the certifier whenever call you do something, certifier. especially if, you, if, you, if, if you're not sure, a phone call is pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Getting kicked out is hard. The phone call is easy. Yeah, thank you for those comments. Okay. I'm going to go back. He's got his hand up for a while. Alan. I'm curious um, in regards to what you were told about organic fertility going into the transition what you've discovered works, and what you wish you had. You, you, 
Maybe we should start with you because you're planning. So the question was, let me see if I can reinterpret this, is what were the things that you were told about managing fertility and organics as you're getting in? What have you found the reality to be and the things that actually work? And what do you wish you had to manage it better? Is that right? Yeah. All right. So I guess just uh, starting in transition, um, you know, coming from the conventional cropping side, um, you know, every plant needs nutrients. So how do we supply those nutrients to the plant? So thinking we've got to put, you know, an NPK, sulfur, whatever micronutrient product on to feed the plant. Um, that's our thought and that kind of comes from the conventional world. Uh, as we get more into this, you know, looking at, um, you know, how do we use uh, cover crops to help build our soil health? How can we make our soil healthier so that it can cycle nutrients to feed our crop? Um, so that's something we're learning as we're going into it. Um, but I guess uh, beyond that, I can't speak too much because we're, we're not quite there yet. Uh, well, for, for, for us, I think, um, yeah, you, you do, when you're coming from the conventional side into the organic, mindset it, it is it's a definite shift of, of gears in terms of thinking about it but um, yeah I think the things that have worked well for us is we've used I mean we have livestock so we have a lot of manure that we can get not all we can't cover all of our ground that, that needs it with the manure but we cover as much as we can and then what I can't uh, do with our own manure I will buy either either a turkey litter or pelletized turkey litter and to me, the manure side of things seems to have worked the best just because it kind of has, I mean, you can, it kind of has what you need in it. You know, a good rotational system and a good uh, a whole, looking at the farm in a holistic way, you know, of saying, well, what are, what are things you can either raise, you know, with cattle or, or pigs or, or uh, you know, sheep, poultry, whatever, you know, you can use, you, you know, to kind of fit your, fit your system. So, um, and then rotation, you know, good rotation. So those are the things that have worked well for us. Uh, I know there's a lot of things out there that can be, that people market to you, but for me, that's what I've used. And manure has been the, the stepping stone for my nutrition program. I think the biggest change from my thought process today versus my thought process as a conventional farmer was I used to put the nutrients on to feed the crop. And today, I try to feed the soil so the soil can feed the crop. Because ultimately, that's how biology works. So it's just a little longer term thinking, and the manure is helping do some of that over the course of a couple of years. You're not getting all of the quote unquote benefit today. Uh, so you need to think about, okay, I'm gonna continue to mineralize some of this in, you know, 12 months out, 24 months out. Um, I think we're all fortunate in this room who are transitioning and thinking about transitioning for all the people that came before us because there are a lot of products available uh, that were not available 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, so what do I wish I had? Uh, probably another three, four percent of organic matter. That's all I need. <laughs> what are your organic matters? Uh, my organic matters are poor. Because you're on sand. One, those sands, yeah, yeah. One, one. one to two. Okay. Any any follow-ups on that? Yeah. Um, yeah I'm, sure. If we're if we're going to be really honest, is there anything that you missed from the conventional sphere that you wish you still had access to? I'm just curious because, like, I think this is the thing with transitioning farmers. Is there's we have all these things that we have to change in order to win this. But I think some of us probably went back and go, "Boy, I still wish I had that." Sure, I wish I had 28%. I wish I could use 28%. I wish I had some cheap nitrogen that I could put on corn. Yeah, that makes life way easier. Need it. Uh, I do run out of N. It turns yellow mm -hmm. on what year or every year? I'm on one to 2% organic matter. Oh. Mm -hmm. So I can't hold very much to start with. My CECs are poor, so I run out of N every year. What, what kind of yield do you get? Last year, uh, 400 acres of corn, my farm average was 156. With more in, you'd be up to 180, maybe 190. 
uh, probably with uh, out a couple of farms that I shouldn't have planted, I probably would have been there this year. So I have a couple questions along this line. I talked to Jeff and the other one personally last night and today, and Jeff kept indicating, you know, he goes with a wheat crop and then he puts all of his lime and manure on after that, right? But according to my, my friend here who has a lot of cattle, if you put your liquid manure on in July, early August, you're gonna lose all of your nitrogen has been volatilized, right? Right, because the soil's soil's so warm, too warm to... it's not gonna stick around. Yeah, Jeff says, you know, you feed the soil in August, and it's in the soil. You know, right here it's not in the soil. You can't take agronomy out of the picture still though. You know, what? Right. you can't take agronomy out of the, or the science of agronomy out of the farming picture, you know, applying a nutrient, a leachable nutrient, you know, before a crop's going to use it, you know, so You're, you'll you be subject spray, to loss. You'd need something in there yeah. to tie you it know, up, to, to take it up, to some, some, right, like, like a, a cover like crop a cover or something. Crop that might take it up fairly quickly and then it. hold okay, it so and then release it the then, next spring. That should carry through and provide all the nitrogen you or need. Or a cereal rye or something that's going to sink some of that nitrogen rain. a little better. Certain crops will take that nitrogen up better. And hold it. Yeah, so, so and then release it later. That. We, we spread some of our manure in the fall and some in the, in the spring. And ours, we don't have liquid. Uh, ours is, um, it's a bedding pack is a, with the pigs. It's a, we sell them totally in places like that. And so, um, you know, but it's a, it's a, bedding pack mixed with with corn stalks old straw all that kind of stuff and so you get you get, enough, you get sufficient you get sufficient nitrogen that way? when we put it on yeah and uh, when we put it on thick enough with that but it's composted we 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 have it sit out and 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 a lot of uh, carbon <laughs> that goes into it we get a lot of wood chips and everything too that we mix into that manure and so between all of that it can kind of tie that bind that up a little longer yeah, and then then we can put it on of course, like with your turkey manure, your, your wood chips end up utilizing a lot of it that you can use to break down, so yeah. you don't really get too much of a kick at all. Well, you, for us, a lot of times, I mean, we have a, a compost pile that, that, that we will go and, and turn, and I mean, we add wood chips into it, and we mix it all in with the manure, and um, so that'll help break down that carbon real much quicker uh, with the manure and the nitrogen that's in there. If you, if you just have wood chips, it takes like five years to break those down. But if you uh, mix it with manure, it can break it down in a uh, quicker time. I only run, or live primarily run poultry manure, uh, layer manure, and we spread it all in the spring, typically within two days of planting. Spread it, work it, and plant it. So we do not spread any in the fall because I don't think I can hold it. We have a little higher. Okay. Better. Yeah, better but soils, you have, you have a few more so. options. Yeah. So it's egg layer. Correct. Okay, so right. There's, less, there's, less there's no bedding typically. No bedding. Later. Yeah. Now this this last year on some of my oat ground, I put turkey manure on, worked it in, and planted that, and it fed the weeds very well. <laughs> so it was hot. I mean, you could tell wherever I didn't have that spread, the oats did okay. Where I had that manure, the weeds came faster than the oats. Okay, so then what would you do differently? Uh, well, it was a terrible year for oats because we couldn't get into the field because it was so wet. I shouldn't have planted oats <laughs> uh, because I, I, I stuck to what I was going to do and I should have when it got to, because we didn't plant until May 1st. Well, we should, if you don't plant them in April, you shouldn't plant oats. You need to roll to plan B. Or you, and you always have to kind of think of, hey, if this isn't gonna work, what else can I do? Because I, I stuck with the plan and got burned in it. So <laughs> you need to roll to something else. You know, I should have planted like a, a, a bean late uh, you know, you could you could go with a short variety of bean plant it late, and like you were saying, your thing. You know, the weeds then. You know, if you if you plant it late, you know, and get a shorter variety of bean, you can still do okay. Right. Well, uh, and most, most of all, your weeds have already germinated by the yeah. second week in June. So if you can plant after June, like with your pintos, you're in good shape. Yeah, I, I think uh, a quote from uh, Joel Groover. He'll be speaking tomorrow with I think Gary Zimmer on rotations, crop rotations, it kind of hits on this point about how you should have gone to plan B on the oats, but Joel says that crop rotations should evolve and not revolve. We mm -hmm. often just want to stick to that set mm -hmm. 
yeah. revolution, yeah. crop rotation, and we need to be willing to to evolve that Quick rotation. To pull yeah. the trigger onto it. Yeah. Hey, hang on, hang on. Right. There's somebody else who is. Yeah, go ahead. I'll jump on that one right away. My greatest pain in transition has been financial, and I wish I had a financial institution that had a little bit of vision, and I feel like the banks are all set up with big ag in mind, and we've all consolidated in agriculture, and this is how we measure the, the metrics of how successful you are on your farm is how you measure up against everybody else, and they don't pay attention you know, they, I feel like everybody stares right at their feet yep. and they need to pick their head up and look around the room and say, well, wow, this is really where we're going. This is this person's vision. There's so much opportunity. I would have, I would have all of my farm certified organic already if I had had access to capital. So you and I should talk after the session here that if you, I mean, you got gold bars in your pockets, I mean, I can alleviate you of the weight you're carrying around, if that's what you're saying. And so what you're saying is different from the question you got earlier about what am I missing with this cost of transition? You're Correct. talking about getting operating loans, mm -hmm. getting right. access to capital. I'm talking about right. people yep. being comfortable, yep. expre you know, extending you capital, yep. because they are uncomfortable that you are now starting to go into uncharted waters. Yeah. And I understand business is inherently risky, but not. I never had anyone tell me, well, I'll make you the loan, but I'm gonna charge you an extra point and a half for risk premium. Okay, then that's a business decision that I can make and say, well, would I pay the extra point and a half? No, they just shut you down right away and say, we're not interested. That's, that's been my experience. And maybe somebody who has a different farming experience, maybe they got a little bigger pile of equity than what I've got, Maybe they've had a different experience than what I have had. Hopefully, it's been different for some other folks. Heaven forbid a banker actually be flexible once. Boy, I tell you what. <laughs> I guess I'd say as far as the resources, I think uh, they're very abundant. You know, uh, well, you're a good resource, Anders, and uh, everybody in this room, all the conferences. So I think, I think it's a great time. I mean, I don't feel like I'm missing anything, or you know, and just feel like I've been slowly learning and talking and taking stuff in over the last, you know, 10 years to get to this point. And I think that all helps, you know, just start slow and learn as you go. And um, before you make the big step, you know, uh, approach it from a position of uh, power, so to speak, versus a position of weakness. Anything to add, John? Good? No. Okay, we got just a couple minutes left. Any other questions? No, back over here. <laughs> So I don't live in a bean area, typically. My part of uh, Michigan doesn't even have a tea yield for my county or surrounding counties. So we're, we don't raise beans there. Uh, there's a lot of beans grown in the Thumb of Michigan. That's 250 miles from me. Um, that's where I'm contracted, my beans go. And yeah, we, we don't raise hard beans. There are beans for, edible beans for people like Joel, and then there are edible beans for people who know how to raise edible beans. Okay. And I raise black and pinnels because they're the easiest bean, edible beans that you can raise. You can direct cut them. They are pretty well erect in their growth habits. Um, I'm not raising dark red kidneys or white kidneys, for instance. Something that you know you really gotta know what you're doing. Um, I am not that smart, so I'm not that good a farmer. We're getting better, but that's we we took the the low end. So your black and pinnel, that's going to which market? Uh, I, I guess they go into a can and a bag and all kinds of other things. It goes to a major broker who no, has lots of it. color cracks. 
certainly they grade them and we don't do perfectly and you get some skin checks and you do all these things. Certainly there is that. What's your yield on your pinnacle? What price you get for contract? The contracted price is about 70 bucks per, per bag, per hundred, 70 cents a pound. 70 cents a pound, okay. So you're like your red kidney beans would be maybe a dollar 13. I don't know what red kidneys are. I don't know. I can't speak to that. How many pounds an acre? We've raised 900 pounds and we've raised 3,000 pounds. And it can be in anywhere in between, depending on how good of a job I did, what Mother Nature gave me. We've had great success and we've had abysmal failure. All right, so we are at the end of this session. So looking forward, uh, it looks like we have a bit of a break, uh, I think, to visit with our with the sponsors and, and exhibitors in the other room. And then we start again with another set of breakouts at 4 o'clock. Uh, in this room, Harriet Bihar will be presenting on organic certification basics, so talking about some of the key pieces of NLP and the transition and certification process. And then we have a panel of folks talking about new equipment technologies for row crop and cover crop management. That's from 4 to 5.15. So uh, again, you heard them say it, meetings, networking, connecting with other farmers. You've got a bunch of great opportunities coming up of other conferences. Moses Conference uh, in La Crosse is February 22nd through 24th. The Land Connection Organic Grain Conference is February 13th and 14th in Champaign. And then the Indiana Organic Grain Meeting uh, March 6th and 7th in West Lafayette. So if any of those fit for you, uh, we'd love to see you there. Thanks.